On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I tell the story of Danita Smith, a 25-year-old woman who was murdered on January 4th, 2007, in Durham, North Carolina. At the time, Danita was a graduate student and was engaged to her longtime boyfriend. But on the morning of January 4th, Danita left her home, and as she walked down the stairs of her apartment complex, someone came up behind her and shot her in the back of the head. When police began investigating why someone would want Danita dead, they discovered that Danita's fiancé was keeping secrets from her. Secrets that would ultimately be the reason that Danita was murdered. This is Danita's story. When it comes to the story of what happened to Danita Smith, there are so many lessons that we can learn from the senseless tragedy that took her life. But she was more than just a murder victim. She was a young woman with a story and a life before all of this happened to her. And that's what her family wants people to remember about her. No matter how many times her story is told, remembering the victim at the center of the story is the most important part. Danita Smith was born on November 20th, 1981 in Charlotte, North Carolina. Her parents were Calvin and Sharon Smith, and she had two siblings, one brother and one sister. Her mom, Sharon, described her as a typical child who was happy and never caused any trouble. She attended West Charlotte High School, and after high school, she went on to attend North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. There, she majored in English, and people close to her said that Danita was a smart girl who was ambitious and worked hard to achieve the goals that she set out for herself. But she was also a selfless person who friends said would always be there to pick you up when you needed it. Everyone who knew Danita loved her. At NC Central, she became a member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, creating lifelong bonds with her sorors who adored and admired Danita's loving and sweet demeanor. Outside of school and her sorority, Danita had a passion for photography. Ever since she was a child, her mom said that she loved the camera. While at NC Central, she worked as a photojournalist for the student newspaper, and that's what she planned to do when she finished school. After graduating with her bachelor's degree, Danita decided to continue her education and enrolled in a graduate program at NC Central so she could earn her master's degree. Danita's friends and family said that she was focused, and when she set a goal for herself, she worked hard until she achieved that goal. She was driven, and she was well on her way to accomplishing all of her goals. On campus at NC Central, Danita was popular and well-respected by her peers and professors. While she was an undergrad, Danita met a young man named Jameer Stroud. He was also a student at NC Central, and they began dating. Described as the it couple on campus, her friends said that Danita spoke highly of Jameer. He was kind, a good student, attentive, everything you would want in a boyfriend. Her mom said that she too, after meeting Jameer, felt the same way. Sharon told Dateline in an episode about Danita's murder that She tried to find every reason not to like Jameer, but she couldn't. She said that he was always polite and respectful. And so, even though as a mom, she had her apprehensions, she grew to really like Jameer. Danita and Jameer dated for years, even after he moved to Greensboro to become a police officer. The relationship got more and more serious, and in November 2006, Jameer asked Danita to marry him. As the year came to an end, Danita was finishing up her master's degree and planning her and Jameer's wedding. Everything was going well for her, and she was excited. She had even landed a fellowship with the New York Times so she could pursue her dream of becoming a photojournalist. At just 25 years old, Danita had everything she wanted in life. Love, a promising career ahead of her, and friends and family who loved her. Life was good. but. What Danita didn't know was that everything wasn't as it seemed in her relationship with Jameer. He was keeping a secret. And before Danita ever found out the truth, 
she was murdered. As 2007 began, Danita was living in the campus crossing apartments in Durham and was preparing for the spring semester at North Carolina Central to begin. Her family said that she was pretty busy in those first few days of January as she got ready for school to start back. But on January 4th, 2007, everything changed. At around 8.10 a.m. that day, a maintenance worker at the campus crossing heard what sounded like a single gunshot near the 1100 building in the complex. He said that after he heard the shot, he saw a young woman running towards the back of the building where the parking lot was located. The maintenance worker said that the route that she took was kind of strange because anyone who lived in the building would know that there was an easier path to the parking lot. And so the maintenance worker said that after he saw the young woman, he got in his car and drove closer to the building, and he saw what appeared to be the same young woman driving a burgundy SUV. When he drove up to the car that she was driving, he said that she was hysterical. She was crying, and she had her hands covering her mouth as if she was in shock. The maintenance worker asked her if she had heard the gunshot, and she shook her head yes, indicating that she had. And she told him that she was so upset because she was terrified of guns. She told him that she lived at the campus crossing in building 1200. And so he told her to go there and wait while he called the police. The maintenance worker said that he saw the young woman again as he was on the phone with 911, who arrived a short time later. But by the time they arrived, the young woman in the SUV was gone. At the time, police did not take a police report about the gunshot because when they arrived, they could not locate a shooting or any kind of crime scene, and so they left. But two hours after the maintenance worker heard that gunshot, 911 received another call. Shortly before 10 a.m., a man was leaving his apartment at Campus Crossing to go to work. And when he got to the steps, he noticed someone's personal belongings scattered down the stairs. At first, he thought maybe someone had dropped their things as they were coming up the steps. But when he looked down the staircase, at the bottom, he saw a body and could tell that the person was not breathing. After the discovery, he immediately called 911. In his call, a neighbor said that it appeared as if the person laying at the bottom of the stairwell had fallen down the steps and hit their head because the victim was bleeding from their head. He asked the 911 operator if he should look at the purse that was there to see if he could find ID, and the operator told him yes. When he looked in the purse, he found the ID for Danita Smith. In the 911 call, you can hear him call her name once he learns it from the ID, but Danita was not moving, and she was not breathing. After calling 911, the neighbor went to the apartment complex office to tell the maintenance man about Danita. Once Danita's identity was discovered, and it was determined that she was a student at NC Central, the school was notified, and so were Danita's parents. Sharon said that she was told that Danita had fallen and she was unconscious and they were trying to get her up. At the time, Sharon and her other children were all still living in Charlotte, which is about two hours from Durham. And so she got in her car and started to make her way to Durham to check on her daughter. But since she knew it was going to take her a while, she called Jameer, Danita's fiancé, to tell him what was going on. Sharon said she asked Jameer to go to Durham because she knew that he would be there before her. At the time, all anyone in Danita's family knew was that she had some kind of accident, but no one knew what had actually happened. Danita's best friend, Edith, said that she had been calling Danita that morning but hadn't gotten a response from her, which she knew was unusual. This was her best friend, and Danita always returned her call. At the time, her brother was also living in the same apartments, and so he called Edith after learning about the accident at the apartments. According to court records, he asked his sister if she had talked to Danita because he had heard something was going on at the complex. 
Edith attempted to call Danita, but after not getting a response, she decided to call Jameer to see if he had spoken to Danita. By this time, Jameer knew that something had happened to Danita because he had received a call from her mom. He told Edith that he had heard that something was going on at the apartment and that he was on his way to Durham as they spoke. She said his answers about Danita were kind of vague when she asked if he had spoken to her, but she said that he told her that he was on his way to Danita and he would keep her posted. When the paramedics arrived at the scene, they quickly determined that Danita was dead. Now detectives would need to determine, was this an accident or had someone killed Danita? Once the detectives arrived and taped off the crime scene, they began trying to determine what exactly happened. And when they took a closer look at Danita's body, they realized that this was not an accident at all. Danita had a single gunshot wound to the back of her head. This was a murder. It didn't take them long to rule out the possibility that this was robbery because nothing had been taken. Her purse and her keys were all found near her body. It appeared as if Danita had been leaving her apartment that morning when someone came up behind her and shot her in the head as she headed down the stairs. The question they needed to answer was why? As police collected evidence and processed the scene, one by one, Danita's loved ones arrived at the campus crossing apartments. First Edith, then Jameer, and then Sharon. And they were told that Danita was dead. Sharon recalled in her Dateline interview the moment police delivered the devastating news that her daughter had been murdered. And after that, her life was never the same. At the crime scene, police spoke to Jameer, who gave them his information and answered a few questions. Being her fiancé meant that he was going to need to be ruled out as a suspect. But in the hours after Danita was found, detectives allowed him to go back to Greensboro. Two hours after Danita's body was found at the bottom of that staircase, detectives working her case got their first lead when they learned about the 911 call placed that morning. They spoke to the maintenance man, and he told them about hearing the gunshot and seeing the young woman who he said lived in the building. He described her as 5'10", with a ponytail in her hair, driving a burgundy SUV. The way he described the young woman's demeanor, initially, detectives believed that she was possibly an eyewitness to the shooting. And so, detectives began to try and track down this woman and find out what she had seen, if anything. The day after the murder, on January 5th, 2007, according to court documents, Jameer heard that detectives in Durham were looking for a burgundy SUV. And so he called the lead detective because he knew someone who drove a car matching that description. The detectives asked Jameer to return to Durham so they could question him formally, and he agreed. When Jameer came back to Durham and sat down with detectives, what he told him in that interview would break this case wide open. On January 4th, 2007, 25-year-old Danita Smith was found shot to death at the bottom of the stairs at her Durham, North Carolina apartment complex. Within hours of her murder, detectives had already gotten their first lead. And as they began their investigation, they uncovered a web of lies and betrayal. After Danita's body was found, police discovered, after speaking to the maintenance man at the complex, that on the morning Danita was murdered, he saw a young woman leaving the complex in a burgundy SUV. The woman told him that she heard the gunshots. And so the maintenance man didn't know the woman, but detectives needed to find her because they believe she may be a witness and have valuable information. But it didn't take very long to find her because the day after the murder, the lead detective on the case got a call from Jameer telling him that 
he knew someone who drove an SUV matching that description. On January 5th, 2007, Jameer came back to Durham and sat down with detectives and told them that he knew a woman named Shannon Crawley who drove a burgundy SUV. Shannon was a 911 dispatcher in Greensboro, and they had been in a sexual relationship from 2004 through 2005, according to him, but had broken things off over a year before the murder. He told detectives he had first met Shannon when he was in the police academy a few years before. At the time, he was dating Danita, and he told detectives that he told Shannon that at the time. A few years later, in 2004, he saw Shannon again, and this time he said he asked for her number. Now, even though he was in a long-term relationship with Danita, Jameer told detectives that Shannon was beautiful, and so he started cheating on Danita. The detective asked Jameer if the two women knew each other, but he told them they had never met. But he did have a picture of Danita in his apartment, and When Shannon helped him move, she saw it. He said that she knew about Danita, but Danita had no idea about Shannon. He also told them that at some point in their relationship, Shannon had gotten pregnant, but she had gotten an abortion. After speaking to Jameer, the lead detective on the case drove to Greensboro so he could speak to Shannon. When he sat down with her... The detective said that Shannon was polite and cooperative. She told police that on the morning of the murder that she had taken her son to the doctor, which caused her to be late to work. She admitted to having a relationship with Jameer and cooperated much of his story, including the fact that the relationship had ended in January 2006 after she had an abortion. The detective asked her when was the last time that she was in Durham, but Shannon said that she had never been to Durham, and when he asked her if she owned a gun, she told him that she never owned a gun because she hated guns. Shannon told the detective that she had never met Danita and had nothing to do with her murder. And when she was asked did she think Jameer was capable of murder, she said no. But as the detective left Shannon's job, a coworker slipped him a note telling him that he had information that may help. When the detective spoke to her coworker, they told him that Jameer had been calling Shannon at work and harassing her. He told him that the calls went back months and that Shannon had confided in him that she was afraid for her life. She told her coworker that Jameer would show up at her house at all hours of the night and always had his gun with him. Worried about her, the coworker offered to sell her a gun, a 38 caliber handgun, and he had even given her bullets and showed her how to use it. But what the coworker told detectives was concerning because it contradicted what Shannon had just told them a few minutes prior. She never mentioned being in fear for her life. In fact, she told the detective that she didn't think Jameer was capable of murder. And she said she never owned a gun. And so this new information raised the detective's suspicions about not only Shannon, but Jameer too. If Shannon had a reason to fear him, then should Danita have had the same fear? On January 6, 2007, detectives called Jameer back into the station to speak to him again. And when they spoke to him, Jameer denied harassing Shannon at work and said she had no reason to be afraid of him. But when the detectives asked him if he thought that Shannon was capable of murder, he gave them a different answer than she had. Jameer said yes. After speaking to Jameer, investigators went back to the campus crossing apartments to speak to the maintenance man and show him Shannon's picture. When he was shown her photo, He said he couldn't be sure if the woman he saw was Shannon, but when he was shown a picture of her car, he said he was positive that it was the SUV that he saw that morning. But without the witness placing Shannon at the scene that morning, detectives were going to need to find more evidence. 
And one thing that stood out to them was the description of what the maintenance man said the woman was wearing. He said the shirt that she had on had some kind of patch. And not so ironically, Shannon's uniform for work at the 911 call center was a shirt that had patches on it. They had also learned from her supervisor that Shannon had clocked into work at 10 a.m. that morning, and so she had enough time to drive to and from Durham. The information that police were gathering about Shannon was moving her up on their suspect list. Although she had accused Jameer of being abusive, so far, the only one not telling them the whole truth was Shannon. It had also been revealed that the bullet that killed Danita likely came from a 38 caliber weapon, the same caliber gun that Shannon had omitted owning. And so, with all this information, detectives were able to obtain a search warrant for Shannon's home. When police searched her house, they didn't find any evidence that she had been involved in Danita's murder. There were no bloody clothes, no gun, and no bullets. They did find her work uniform with the patches on it, but nothing that would point to Shannon as the killer. As the investigation continued, police turned to Shannon's cell phone records to determine if she was where she said she was on January 4th. And when the detective spoke to Shannon the day after the murder, she told him that she had never been to Durham. But when they checked her phone, the record said that this was another thing that Shannon had not been fully truthful about. The day before Danita's murder, Shannon's cell phone pinged at a tower a hundred feet away from where Danita lived. Police began to theorize that Shannon had gone to Danita's apartment complex that day to scope out the place. At the same time detectives were looking into Shannon's phone records, they also looked at Jameer's. And his phone indicated that he was nowhere near Durham that day. As the investigation into Danita's murder deepened, detectives were finding more and more evidence that pointed to Shannon as their killer. She was, in many ways, an unlikely suspect. A single mom of two, raising her kids and working as a 911 dispatcher. She did not seem like the kind of person that would murder someone in cold blood. But the evidence was mounting. Shannon's car was impounded and tested for gunshot residue. They swabbed the steering wheel and the gear shift, and the test came back positive. They also spoke to the doctor's office where Shannon said she had taken her son the morning of the murder. But the doctor's office told them that Shannon did not show up to that appointment. Investigators felt like they finally had enough evidence to arrest Shannon for Danita's murder. And so five days after Danita was found dead at the bottom of a staircase, Shannon Crawley was arrested. The one thing that police had not been clear about was the motive for Danita's murder. They knew that there was a love triangle, but as far as they knew, the relationship had ended a year before the murder, and so why would Shannon kill Danita? Well, police concluded that Shannon had been obsessed with Jameer. He told them that even after they broke things off, she continued to call him and harass him. He said that she just wouldn't take no for an answer. Shannon's family, however, insists that it was Jameer that was obsessed stalking her and showing up to her house uninvited. But investigators didn't believe that. They believed Jameer. They said that three months before the murder, Shannon bought a house just minutes from where Jameer lived. The detective said that everything came to a head for Shannon when she was in church on Christmas Eve and saw Jameer and Danita there. It was after he had proposed, and they said it was the first time that she had heard of the engagement. Her parents, however, disputed this fact and said that Shannon wasn't even at church that day. They were. But detectives and prosecutors were sure that Shannon Crawley was the murderer. And after her arraignment, 
Shannon was released on bail while she awaited trial. In May 2007, five months after Danita's murder, Shannon contacted the Durham police and told them that she wanted to talk about January 4th, 2007, the day that Danita was murdered. Shannon, accompanied by her lawyer, came into the station and she told police the story that she had never told them before. She said that it started when she had the abortion. She claimed that Jameer was upset and that after they stopped dating, he started stalking her and harassing her. Now, in an earlier interview, Shannon told the detective on the case that Jameer told her that he didn't want to have a baby with her. But the story that she told this time gave a completely different impression of that situation. She said that he had threatened her and her children, and that's why she had gotten the gun. On January 3rd, 2007, Shannon said that she came home and found Jameer in her house, in her bedroom. She said he told her that he had a gun and that she needed to be quiet. Shannon then said that Jameer forced her to get in the car and drive with him to Durham. She said that they drove back to Greensboro, and then after that, Jameer left. Now, it's not clear what she said happened when they got to Durham, but she said the next morning he came back and again, at gunpoint, forced her to go with him to Durham. Shannon told the detective that he threatened to kill her and her children, and so out of fear for her life and her kids, she went with him again. She said they drove to the campus crossing apartments where Denita lived, and Jameer got out of the car and went up the stairs. She said that she heard arguing, and so she got out of the car. And she said she walked a few feet when she heard a gunshot. She said Jameer came back to the car and got in the driver's seat, but then told her to get in the driver's seat while he crouched down in the back seat. When she was driving away, that's when she encountered the maintenance man, and she said that he couldn't see Jameer because he was hiding. Shannon's story was compelling, but detectives did not believe her account. At that point, they felt like she had been less than truthful, and so this new story, five months after the murder, wasn't moving them. But Shannon insisted that she was telling the truth. She told detectives that Jameer was still calling her, threatening her not to talk to the police. The prosecutor on the case told Shannon to bring him proof. And not long after, Shannon brought the prosecutor audio recordings that she said were proof that Jameer was threatening her. The prosecutor listened to the tapes that Shannon brought him, and in the recordings, you can hear her speaking to a male voice. But the voice that was on the tape did not sound like Jameer. At that point, police and prosecutors had spoken to Jameer several times, and the voice on the recordings did not sound like his. Instead of the recording clearing her and pointing the spotlight back on Jameer, it did the opposite and solidified that prosecutors had the right person. After her arrest, Shannon had moved in with her parents and Charlotte. According to them, they had witnessed the stalking firsthand, and it had continued even after their daughter moved away. In June 2008, while Shannon was still awaiting trial, she contacted the Charlotte Police Department and reported that Jameer had came there and raped her. She said that he attacked her with a knife and had cut off her clothes. When police arrived, they did notice lacerations on her neck and thigh, but when she was brought to the hospital and a rape kit was performed, it came back negative, and she showed no signs of forced penetration. Shannon had insisted that she needed stitches, but none of the cuts were deep enough to need stitches. Shannon, during her interview with police, accused Jameer and told them that they should check his trash can for the knife. Three days after the alleged rape, Back in Greensboro, Jameer was taking out his trash when he noticed a knife at the bottom of his empty can. 
He called the police, who interviewed Jameer's neighbors, and they told the police that a few nights before, they saw someone drive up and put something in Jameer's trash can and then drive off. The detectives investigating the rape, also after checking Jameer's cell phone records, didn't believe that he would have had enough time to be able to make the 120-mile trip there and back. And so... Shannon's accusation of rape for investigators was becoming just another one of her lies. Despite her attempt to point the finger at Jameer, the charges against Shannon remained, and in February 2010, her trial began. The prosecution laid out a case that painted Shannon as an obsessed ex-lover who just couldn't take no for an answer. Jameer testified at the trial and told the jury about the months leading up to the murder. Prosecutors said that Shannon stalked and harassed Jameer, and when she found out that Jameer and Danita were engaged, she decided that Danita had to die. The defense argued that it was Jameer that was obsessed. They said that he was angry when Shannon ended the pregnancy, and Shannon testified in her own defense. And she told the jury that she was afraid of Jameer. He became controlling and his behavior increasingly more erratic before Danita's murder. The jury was also allowed to hear the audio recordings that Shannon said were of Jameer. The defense tried their best to create reasonable doubt, but the evidence that the prosecution laid out, although mostly circumstantial, painted a crystal clear picture of what they said. Shannon did on January 4th, 2007. The trial only lasted a couple of weeks, and on February 22nd, 2010, Shannon Crawley was found guilty of first-degree murder, and she was sentenced to life in prison. Shannon's parents maintain that she is innocent, and Jameer is the real killer. They believed that there was some kind of cover-up and that their daughter was framed. For Danita's family, getting a conviction closed one chapter of this tragedy, but there's no justice when someone you loved is murdered for absolutely no reason. Danita Smith had made the right choices in life, and so it's hard to understand why her life had to end the way it did. She most likely never even saw it coming. Probably walked right past her killer, headed down the steps, and then, in a blink of an eye, she was gone, and her family and friends' world were shattered. For his part, Jameer said at the trial that he was embarrassed that he had been dating both women, and I'm sure the guilt he feels is a sentence in and of itself. The police and prosecutors said that Danita was murdered out of jealousy. And what we all know is that jealousy can make people do horrible things. Even things you never thought they were capable of. Danita was a young woman who was looking forward to graduating and getting married. There are really no words for how senseless and tragic her death was. But she should be remembered as more than the victim of a love triangle gone wrong. She should be remembered as a daughter, a sister, a friend, as a person who was intelligent and ambitious, a person who was loved and will forever be missed. May Danita Smith rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Threads.